We have a broken structure of care. Yeah. They leave the minute they either become mothers or they think they want to become mothers. Mm. Yeah. And they look around and they say, can I do that here? And the answer is normally no. Even if you think about the way that we've built workplaces, you know, we've built workplaces where the, you know, the day is nine to five when schools start at eight and they end at three. Yeah. You're already setting up women to fail. When we were workers and mothers, it's just untenable. And society told us, well, it's your fault. And not the fact that it is actually my workplace's fault. It is the economy's fault. It's the government's fault because you are setting me up to fail. One of the things that you know we're doing with Moms First in partnership with BCG is we're collecting that data for companies like Disney, like Meridian, others who have, you know, or Google, Salesforce, who have been in-house childcare centers have been providing childcare subsidies. And what we're finding that essentially it pays for itself. Wow. Right? That the, the, the savings that you get on workers not missing work, mm -hmm. on, huh. on, a, on a, having lower rates of attrition, you know, it, it, the average worker leaves at eight months. It costs a salary and a half to replace that person. Mm -hmm. You provide this benefit for me, I'm sticking with you. You probably haven't done the data analysis on the savings, right? Yeah. Because you kind of know that intuitively, but I do think that we have to put that out there in the world. Right, and really just prove the business case right. once and for all. So this point about, oh, I, but it's really expensive and you're just doing it because it's the right thing, it's just put to rest. Being in a corporate environment for so many years in many different organizations, people find money and organizations find money what's important to them. I've never had a budget said no to if it didn't have a really good business case and if the organization was behind it. It's core to our business and it's core to the, our values. We don't feel that if you are leaving out a population of people in decision making and driving business revenue, you are actually doing the right thing. is ranked among the top countries in the world when it comes to gender parity. We're always ranked among sometimes top five, sometimes in, within the top ten yeah. in the world. But what did it take for Rwanda to, to, to reach that level of parity? I think one important aspect is that deliberate leadership for gender inclusion is important. Mm. Leadership that is deliberately making sure that gender inclusiveness happens. And that, that requires people actually making sure it, it happens. It's not going to happen on its own. Today we have 61% of our parliament uh, constituted by women. That's the highest in the world. Wow. But to get there, to get women, it wasn't always like that. What has helped over time is that we created a, a decentralized system of governance from the village level to the district, to the sector, to the province, and then to the national level. We require that at every small segment of leadership, women must be uh, included, 30%. So if you have every 10 households, 30% are women, by the time you reach the national level, there's so many women, and those are the women that are growing through the system and becoming members of parliament at the national level. But what that speaks to is supporting a critical mass of pipeline of women that can be mentored, can be exposed to leadership, because when the time comes for them to take on those positions, they are available to do that.
So that same concept of the car turning the corner, learning its new environment, and then deciding if it needs to stop for somebody or you know make a stop because of a stop sign. Well, that same building that today is just simply responding to what the thermostat says, we want to transform that into a building that knows its environment. I know what's happening on the energy grid. I know the occupancy in the building. I know how much the energy costs so I can make far better decisions room by room, like down to the room level, and, and then really drive energy efficiency and much more. The buildings that we work, live, play in account for over 38% of GHG emissions globally. Part of that comes from the construction of new buildings, but the majority of it comes from the daily operations of those buildings. They are by far the biggest energy consumers on our planet. Think about the cost of energy, knowing whether that energy at that moment in time is green or fossil fuel generated. So all that occupancy in the building, all that richness of data brought together and then leveraging the new capabilities that we have at our fingertips now, which is that artificial intelligence, which can both learn that building in a super granular fashion, room by room, but then also make autonomous decisions that are much smarter using that data than a simple thermostat on the wall. Canada is a big country, as you know, and again, the advent of the cloud allows us to deploy those stores uh, in a way that's really efficient and economical. And they've seen very material uh, energy consumption savings, over 20%, uh, both on electricity and gas. Uh, and the, those stores are not large, right? They're typically five, 6,000 square feet. Think about a large home. Um, and, and to be able to do hundreds of them at a time uh, is very exciting. In Malawi, for example, a country we've been in for 13 years, we've been having to help respond to their cholera outbreak that just happened, which was the longest and worst cholera outbreak in the country's history, such that schools shut down, businesses shut down, tens of thousands got sick, thousands died. And that was all because of climate change, because of tropical storms that came over the southern part of Africa, compromised the water, and that, you know, what's happening in health and happening climate doesn't respect borders. Any you know, infectious disease outbreaks, a lot of them emerge from Asia as well. We need to start you know, gathering that knowledge, being advocates, playing our role on this global platform and sharing our ideas as well and our research and our stories. With very little resources, actually, you can create high impact. Why? It's because you work with communities, you work with local resources, you have the ability to listen, to have empathy, and develop solutions that are very, very local, very, very relevant to the, the people who you're trying to help. If I can tell you in Indonesia, you know, there's a place in Kalimantan where people were just chopping down the forest because they needed to raise money for health care. But the minute you sit with communities and say, Here's how you do it. A local organization called ASRI, working with Health in Harmony, says, we'll give you the resources to establish a health uh, clinic. We'll, pro we'll provide the training and the capacity and all the support. They stop the deforestation and they find that they have other means of economic livelihood. Their families are healthy. That's what people want, ultimately. Mm -hmm.